This video is sponsored by HelloFresh, the delivery service that brings fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes right to your door. HelloFresh takes the stress out of meal planning by providing pre-planned meals with a variety of delicious, affordable, and healthy meals to choose from. Customize your choices by swapping or adding proteins, or choose calorie smart or carb smart options. Cut down on time with quick and easy recipes, or add snacks, sides, and desserts from the HelloFresh market. HelloFresh sources its ingredients from the farm to your door within a week, ensuring you receive fresh ingredients and saving you time and money, since it's cheaper than grocery shopping or takeout. As longtime viewers know, I've had struggles with health problems in the past, and pre-planned meal services like HelloFresh are a great way for people with low energy or disabilities to eat well with less stress. You can try HelloFresh today, and by using my link in the description or my personal code, you'll receive a discount on your subscription and help support the channel. Thank you for watching, and thanks to HelloFresh for sponsoring this video. April 11th. 2001, in Tokyo, Japan. The games press have all gathered to attend a special Capcom event, the details of which are mysterious. It's to be an announcement of a game, certainly, but what kind of game, and who would be involved, would be an incredibly unexpected revelation. The game they'd all gathered to see was Clock Tower 3, a title with a turbulent history. The Clock Tower series was a horror franchise with a decade of history, with three titles released in the 1990s. A fourth, titled Clock Tower 3, funnily enough, was in the works back in 1999, directed by Kono Hifumi, creator of the series. Unfortunately, it was not to be. The company behind the games, Human Entertainment, went bankrupt in 2000, and its properties were dispersed to other companies. Unable to continue his work, Kono moved on, and Clock Tower 3 was abandoned. The rights to the series went to Sunsoft, another Japanese game company, and at this April 2001 press conference, a new Clock Tower 3 would be announced, one co-produced by Sunsoft and Capcom, with an entirely new team and a new director. Kono Hifumi had been asked to return, but he'd already begun working on another project at the time. Instead, a new director would step in to take his place. Someone who was both incredibly overly qualified, with decades of work behind him, and also utterly inexperienced, having never worked on or directed a single game. The team he brought with him were also not game developers. Of the 400 names assigned to Clock Tower 3's development, dozens of them have their names attached to one game and one game only. They aren't game developers. They're film crew, and their leader was none other than Fukasaku Kinji, one of Japan's premier film directors. What a surprise it must have been to see a famous film director step onto the stage in front of the words Clock Tower 3. The surprises wouldn't stop. By the end of the presentation, the team that was assembled on stage included well-known and beloved figures from television, film, and even manga, while the producers, programmers, and musicians were all veteran game developers. Many of those working on the art, writing, and game development side had no experience in the field. The inexperience was the point. The idea stemmed from a single team member's vision of exploring the world of film in games. The two fields had incredible similarities and differences, and in the early 2000s they rarely crossed over, and the experiences and techniques used in one field weren't likely known in the other. The plan for Clock Tower 3 was to spearhead the blending of two industries, for film and games to learn from one another, and in the end, create a game that was like a movie and then create a movie based on the game. The heart and soul of the project came down to two individuals, 
both of whom were behind the push to blend the fields of film and games, and who would both tragically pass away within years of the project's release. This is the story of Clock Tower 3, the last directorial work of Japan's genius director, Fukasaku Kinji. First, we have to clarify. Fukasaku Kenji is the director. Resources in the West tend to call him the director of CG for the game, implying he was in charge of the visuals and motion capture alone. Japanese game sources, including magazines and the game guides themselves, state that Fukasaku was not only in charge of the CG, but was overseeing the entire game. He was, in fact, the game's director. Fukasaku Kinji was born in July of 1930 in what was then known as Midorioka Village in the Ibaraki Prefecture. His childhood was defined by war. In 1931, Japan invaded Manchuria. When he was 15, Fukasaku and his classmates were drafted to work in a munitions factory. It was a tense and horrific time. The children were friends while they worked, all the while knowing their own survival was at risk. When bombs started falling, they would duck behind each other, trying to shield themselves from the danger. And in the aftermath, the survivors had to deal with the bodies of the dead. It was an experience that would forever color Fukasaku's views on war and violence. When World War II ended, Japan was still very much in turmoil. The schools were a mess, with teachers unsure of what to teach or what they were allowed to teach. So Fukasaku didn't go back to school. He started spending his time watching movies. Japanese films were banned due to their often jingoistic nature, so he watched foreign films and developed a love for the industry. When he had the chance, he went to school to study film and eventually graduated from the Nihon University of Art in 1953 having studied both directing and screenwriting, alongside figures like Noda Koga and Inomara Katsuhito. He joined Toei in 1954, working as an assistant director alongside Makino Masahiro and Sasaki Yasushi. His own directorial debut came in 1961 with the start of the Kuraibo Detective series, and soon he was on a roll. He worked on dozens of popular films and television shows, and pioneered a shift in the style of Yakuza films, from the idealized honorable figures of old to the realistic and nihilistic modern version. He worked on action films, crime dramas, samurai and war stories, science fiction, and horror. Over the course of his life, he directed more than 40 films across multiple styles and genres, earning the admiration of film viewers and the industry across the globe. In 2000, what would likely become his most famous film in the West was released, Battle Royale, a film adaptation of the 1999 novel, which would become a huge success and invent the modern genre of battle royale fiction. The story of teenagers forced to fight to the death by an oppressive government. The story was hugely controversial at home and the film was given an R15 rating that kept most of the age group it was about, teens, from seeing it. Politicians condemned it. The Japanese censorship board claimed it was dangerous to the youth and it was nearly banned in the country. Fukasaku fought for his film, condemning what he saw as a foolish attempt to control art and the young people. He was rather anti-government in general. Having grown up during and after the war, he saw what was and wasn't changed in the aftermath and worried about the direction his country was going in. Battle Royale, a story about survival in a violent world lacking empathy, could be seen as an attempt to validate young people's feelings in the modern world, and it appealed to them. Despite the rating, older teens showed up to see the film in huge numbers, lines at the theaters running out the door. It set box office records in the country, and to this day, it's considered a classic of Japanese horror. Fukasaku's films often include violence, usually an incredible amount of it. 
but it was never worshipped or seen as glorious so much as it was acknowledged as part of the reality of the world. Fukasaku told stories that had fables at their heart, he once said, explaining that while he wasn't trying to dictate a moral story, he was telling a story that at its heart had meaning. Battle Royale depicted a world in which Japan won World War II, and how that transformed Japan into a far more oppressive, dangerous place for its own people. In the story, the main character attempts to hold on to his own morals and values, while the government and society pressures him into violence. The message is clear, but not overt or overwrought, and it resonated with a generation. But discussing morality wasn't the same as painting the world in black and white. Fukasaku stated in an interview that he preferred to explore good and evil in a more complex style, rather than painting different people as good or evil. We all have the capacity inside us, and the most interesting struggle comes from exploring that juxtaposition within a singular person. He is an incredible talent, a director whose works have influenced, changed, and created genres, who has created multiple massive successes and lesser-known cult classics, who is beloved by his peers and the populace. His thoughts on film and society are poignant and powerful, and watching him work, reading his interviews, one gets the sense of a sensitive, creative man dedicated to improving and pushing his craft as far as it can go. It's no wonder why, when the team behind Clock Tower 3 were first considering what movie director they wanted for the project, that Fukasaku Kinji was their choice. The Clock Tower 3 project didn't begin with Fukasaku. He was brought on by a team that had already decided on the game and the direction they wanted to go in. Two figures seemed to be central to the game's beginnings, Okamoto Yoshiki and Sugimura Naboru, members of a unique team at Capcom called Flagship. Flagship was a team established in 1997 by Okamoto Yoshiki and three others, former Capcom employees looking to start a dedicated team to work on scenarios. According to another game developer years later, it's likely Flagship was the first dedicated scenario writing team, but it was not the last. In the 90s, games were improving in leaps and bounds, and game storytelling had to improve as well. At the time, it was typical for a games writing team to be brought together for a single project and then disbanded. Comparatively, there were established companies and groups who worked on CG art or programming for a company that were never disbanded. Writing wasn't treated the same way, and as a result, the quality was often up in the air. Okamoto Yoshiki was a senior managing director at Capcom when he had the idea to create a dedicated scenario team. He could see where the industry was going, and that such a team would be needed, and began talking with others at the company about the idea. He eventually got the green light and established Flagship in 1997, serving as the company's president and representative director. At the same time, this coincided with the development of Capcom's Resident Evil 2, which at the time was going through some turbulence. An original version of the game, now called Resident Evil 1.5, was trashed when it was more than 50% completed due to various issues and disappointments the team felt with its direction. Okamoto Yoshiki was the supervisor at the time and criticized the game's story to director Mikami Shinji. He felt it was too conclusive and that instead they should try and develop a world and narrative that would invite further development as a series. Attempts to rewrite the story ended with frustration and the project was going nowhere. It was then that Okamoto would hand the story to a writer who had yet to dip his toe into the game's industry. That writer was Sugimura Naboru, a television writer who worked for decades on shows in the tokusatsu genre like Kamen Rider Black and Nebula Mask Machine Man, as well as crime and TV dramas like The Unfettered Shogun, Sekai Ninja Senjiraya, and anime like Lupin the Third. His name appears on over 20 shows and three films up through 1996, when he would make the shift to video games. Sugimura loved the first Resident Evil, and his love led him to become involved in the second game when he was introduced to Okamoto. He began as a consultant writer on the project on a trial basis. As Okamoto oversaw his work, Sugimura was eventually given the go-ahead to write the script. 
the final version of Resident Evil 2 would be his story, and the work cemented his reputation and position as a writer at Capcom. The success was what led Okamoto, Sugimura, and two others to found Flagship in 1997. From there, he would work on multiple Resident Evil, Onimusha, and Dino Crisis games, writing and overseeing the scenarios for the stories, including Code Veronica, Survivor, Dead Aim, and Zero. His script for the original Resident Evil 4 project would be adjusted and rewritten by director Kamiya Hideki to become Devil May Cry, for which he would receive special thanks on the project. For Clock Tower 3, he would be credited for writing the screenplay, but behind the scenes, his involvement's far greater than it seems. Interviews with other game developers imply that the driving force behind the game was in fact Sugimura, and that it was his idea to bring in the film industry. Clock Tower 3 was at the early planning stages when Sugimura began reaching out to film directors to join the project. Fukasaku was an early pick, and eventually stepped in to become the game's director, while Sugimura worked as producer, with the aim being to create a game that would later be adapted into a movie. The blending of two fields and the bridging of two industries was the ultimate goal. Flagship, in fact, became that bridge for many, particularly members of Toei's special effects teams, many of whom left Toei for Flagship around this time, following Sugimura Noboru. He became the overseer of many younger creators in television and games, and was apparently a dedicated and passionate boss, who made sure every member of the writing team, no matter how junior, received their name in the credits. Television, film, and games became blended together in Flagship. A fourth field would bring its influences with the inclusion of another popular, established creator, Noguchi Ryu, who began his creative career as a manga artist. Noguchi was born in 1944 in Higashimachi in the Fukuoka Prefecture. He was inspired to become a manga artist after reading the work of Shotaro Ishimori, and attempted to gain an internship with the man as soon as he could. At first, he was rebuffed. He spent some time working at Studio Zero as a background artist on the series Obake no Kyutaro. But eventually, Ishimura would accept Noguchi as his exclusive assistant, where he would work on the backgrounds of Cyborg 009. In 1970, Noguchi went independent and spent the next 20 years as an artist and designer working on myriad projects but was most well known for his role as a designer on tokusatsu television shows, designing monsters and heroes who were incredibly vivid and unique. In 1990, Okamoto Yoshiki would invite Noguchi to join Capcom. He would eventually join Flagship, and through them became involved as the primary background designer for Clock Tower 3. A third Clock Tower team member to find their way from tokusatsu to games was Amamiya Keita, a film director, artist, and character designer. Born in the Chiba Prefecture in 1959, Amamiya has been active in the creative industry since the 80s. He's worked on Kamen Rider, Ultraman, and Super Sentai, as well as directed the series Garo. He'd worked on character designs for various games since the mid-90s, and for Clock Tower 3, he would design each and every character, drawing more than 60 concepts for the game. Some of his work reveals earlier drafts of the stories, a version in which the main character Alyssa could transform into a holy woman, for instance. He was involved from the earliest stages of development, and specifically remembers director Fukasaku instructing him to make the first enemy, the Hammer Man, so scary it would be traumatic. Amamiya has some fascinating insight into the game's development, he wrote a book on his game design history. Sadly, only some of the pages are available online, and I've yet to obtain a copy myself. But what is there has some fascinating details. One page explains why the game does not in fact have a Scissor Man, an enemy that was central to the series until now. Though Amamiya designed some characters with scissors and fought for their inclusion, other team members, Fukasaku primarily, turned down the design. The reason was the time period. As a game focused on jumping through time, Fukasaku wanted to be realistic to the time periods the characters were in, 
and in that period, apparently scissors wouldn't have been realistic. Amamiya felt that since this was fiction, it wouldn't matter, but Fukasaku was very dedicated to realism in his depictions, or of avoiding deception. So, no scissor monster. He also described the stage where the game's motion capture was filmed. It was shot at the Toei Film Studio in Ozumi Gakuen, Tokyo, on a huge stage that was set up to record video and voices as well as the actors' motions. Amamiya says the setup was so luxurious you could have filmed a movie if they'd had better lighting. Okamoto Yoshiki would comment that when he first saw the set, he was reminded how much the game industry was still amateurish compared to film studios. The sets were built by Toei's art department, and apparently during this time, there was a unique scene where the game and film industries collided. The performances were going to need stairs, and the stairs that were built for film and TV were all 30 centimeters tall. This seemed absolutely wild to the game staff at Flagship. Since when were steps that big? But that was the tradition for filming action-adventure movies, so the proportions were already set and the size of the game's world was increased to account for the large staircases. April 2001. Onto the stage of Clock Tower 3 had walked giants of the film and television industry, announcing their new project. The game, however, was still in the relatively early stages. The game's specifications were about 70% complete, according to Sugimura Noboru but they still didn't have a release date or even actors for their motion capture. It was due to Fukasaku, apparently. The director had an uncompromising attitude, and since this was his first game project, he was particularly careful. They'd only just started casting for their main character, a project that was taking an incredible amount of time. Fukasaku had already auditioned 200 girls for the role, which seemed like a lot to Sugimura and Okamoto, until Fukasaku told them that 800 people had auditioned for Battle Royale. The team in charge of the auditions and motion capture recording was Fukasaku's film production team, Fukasaku Gumi. The suffix added to his name implies this is his personal group, likely people who followed him from the film industry. Not only were they recording the visuals, the voice acting, and the motion capture, but they were also recording the development the team would release a behind-the-scenes making-of documentary for the game as a pre-order bonus in Japan. The film includes an hour of behind-the-scenes footage and interviews, making this one of the best documented games I've ever researched. The role of Alyssa Hamilton would eventually go to Minami, a Japanese actress and model known best for her work in Fukasaku's Battle Royale, where she had her acting debut as the character Keiko. She would be Alyssa's mocap actor, performing her in every cutscene, acting out her game motions and gestures, and poses her for advertisements and flyers. There's been some discussion about the choice in both Eastern and Western fan circles, specifically how a game that's about an English girl had a CG model that looked very Japanese. In fact, Minami herself is half French, though it's undoubtedly true that in-game and CG model faces look very different. Japanese fans even joke she's a Japanese girl who just put on a wig and colored contacts. Working on Clock Tower 3 was apparently an intense experience for everyone involved. It was an enormous project involving multiple companies combining their resources and three large divisions of the team. The gameplay creation team focused on the game concept, programming, art, and design. The original concept movie team working on the motion capture, voice acting, and cutscene development. And the event movie team who worked on the in-game graphics and cutscenes. Then there were the CG development teams who were themselves multiple groups of contracted CG teams from outside the company. First, gameplay creation team where the project began and which would create the core of the game itself. This included the flagship team and the writers who would develop the game's story. They would go through five different versions of the script, developed by Sugimura Noboru and his assistants Nakamoto Hiromichi and Hirano Yosuke, both of whom were flagship writers who likely came from the television field. The concept art would rely on two groups. All the character designs were Amamiya Keita's work, 
while on the background design side, Noguchi Ryu was leading a team with Hiruta Mitsuru, Usanaga Toshiyuki, and Katono Keisuke. These three have almost no presence in the games industry. Only Hiruta has one other game credit working on art for Onemusha Tactics. They were likely also flagship employees brought in from different fields. The fields that would include more industry vets were the programming, planning, and designing departments. Large groups of more than 30 total employees, most of whom were game vets. At the top were the planners in charge of the game's design and style. At the lead was Seto Yasuhiro, a game planner whose career began back in 1999 on Street Fighter III. Alongside him were Ando Yukio, Kaji Josuke, Kakae Koji, and Naka Akiteru all of them Capcom employees who had been working on games since the 90s. The production manager, however, would be a Sunsoft employee, Shimizu Shigeki, a producer who was in charge of the Japanese versions of the Riven and Mist game teams in the 90s. Another Sunsoft employee would be chief programmer, Imaizumi Masahiro, a man whose career began working as a debugger in 1994 and on additional programming for Riven. Clock Tower 3 was his first leadership role, with 12 programmers working beneath him, including Ito Yoshito, a Capcom programmer who worked on Street Fighter, Mega Man, Devil May Cry, and Resident Evil. The development of the game, its cutscenes, its story, and its mocap were all in-house, but the development of the CG cutscenes that were based on the mocap were sent to other groups, including Shirogumi. Established in 1974, Shirogumi has worked on CG for film, TV, music videos, commercials, and starting in the early 2000s, for games. Clock Tower 3 was one of their earliest game projects, but they'd go on to create cinematics for Final Fantasy VII Dirge of Cerberus, Folklore, Demon's Souls, Resident Evil, Dark Side Chronicles, and El Shaddai. One of the major figures from Shirogumi involved in Clock Tower was Yagi Ryuchi. He joined Shirogumi in 2000 and was CG director for multiple Capcom projects, including Resident Evil Zero and Onimusha 2. His career began as an assistant to the technical director working on special effects, making animations for commercials, working on a wide variety of skills. He may have been a central figure in the development of Clock Tower. After the game debuted, he would appear at TGRAF, a Japanese CG convention, to discuss developing Clock Tower 3 CG and his experiences working with Fukasaku. The director didn't have a very in-depth knowledge of CG at the time, but he felt that movement was important. They focused on creating incredibly realistic and dramatic movement to ensure the emotions came across to the player. Watching the motion capture actors makes it clear that a theatrical style was employed something that might be inspired by the tokusatsu background of many of the team. Many of them came from working on superhero shows like Kamen Rider and Metal Hero, Ultraman and Super Sentai, which themselves have very dramatic over-the-top physical motions and reactions. Other CG artists working on Clock Tower 3 from Shirogumi included Suzuki Takayuki, Ogawa Yoichi, and Hanafusa Makoto. A second CG studio involved in Clock Tower was Digital Frontier, led by Ueki Hidenori and Toyoshima Yusaku. Originally established in 1993 as a division of TYO Co., they went independent in 2000 as a CG studio working on movies, TV, commercials, and games. They also seem to have been involved in Onimusha and Resident Evil, and would go on to focus on developing full CG films like Appleseed, Dance Zero, I Am a Hero, and Death Note Light Up the New World. They would win two CG World Awards for their work. These two companies may be closely linked. Not only do they seem to share early projects, but in 2011, they would appear at an industry seminar together, where Yagi Ryuchi and Suzuki Takayuki from Shirogumi and Toyoshima Yusaku from Digital Frontier spoke together. Clock Tower 3's project was enormous, and the amount of work incredible. 
Yet the many separate teams working together never seemed to lose heart. They rallied around their director, a person whose dignity kept the people around him engaged in the work, and even overwhelmed some of the staff. There was certainly some star power at work, and the sense that everyone was working with genius. But Fukusaku wasn't the only one. Examining the people who worked on this project, you find many who would go on to become exceptional talents in their fields. The CG designers would later work on revolutionary, award-winning films. Two of the game planners would continue to make waves working at Capcom. Seto Yasuhiro would go on to work as a game designer on the award-winning Resident Evil 2 remake, and he would co-direct the Resident Evil 3 remake with Ando Yukio. But many others working on this game would fade into obscurity. Their online records are scarce, likely because they were not originally from the game's industry, and they may have left the industry after Clock Tower 3. The game was after all an experiment, a blend of multiple industries, and many of these people would return to those fields in the following years. Clock Tower 3 would debut at game shows in the East and West. Fukasaku would actually appear at one in Japan, as shown in the credits of his making of documentary. In the West, it was E3 2001 that would debut the game, though they had no playable content at the time. Commercials were abundant, some even for the documentary focused on Fukasaku, depicting the unique nature of how the game was made. It would release in December 2002, selling nearly 40,000 units in its first week in Japan. Overall sales would reach 250k within a year, which hardly seems bad, but apparently fell short of Capcom predictions. 450k. It was a trend that most of Capcom's games would follow. Devil May Cry 2, Breath of Fire Dragon Quarter, Resident Evil Zero would all fall short of expectations, despite the fact that all of them sold more than 100,000 units in their first year, and Devil May Cry 2 went over a million. The company lost money that year, possibly because they overprinted their games based on expected sales. My own copy of Clock Tower 3 that I played growing up came from the discount bin at GameStop, where I found it like new and labeled at $5. Whatever the cause, Capcom internally seemed to see the year and its games as failures. The general opinion of Clock Tower 3 wasn't bad, however. It was messy. Some reviewers enjoyed it, some talked it down. Most of the negative opinions stemmed from the gameplay, while positives focused on the CG cutscenes and animation. It was a beautifully made project, but a rough one, possibly because it was helmed by so many who were new to the industry. For fans and avid gamers, gameplay didn't seem to be the problem. Instead, it stemmed from artistic choices made by the team and director Fukasaku himself, in both the East and West, I've found complaints about the heavy stylization and overwrought voice acting, the theatricality of the game, some calling it overdone and exaggerated. Over the years, the opinions seem to have softened, and I think the game has evolved into a campy classic. It's bloody, it's violent, it's goofy, it's fun, it's a little silly, a little gory, a little of everything. The plot and characters are enjoyable, and yes, it is overacted and overperformed. But that was the intention, and if you buy into the camp, you can get so much more out of the experience. That's not to say it's not a story with depth. It's incredibly hard to dismiss the game as being lacking in more serious or horrific content when you consider the director himself. The very first time travel portion goes back to World War II, to the attacks on London, where the main character runs through city streets as bombs drop from above. Dark themes of manipulation, familial abuse, and gendered violence run through the story, and for the time, the incredible capability of the graphics combined with the dark themes and violent imagery made for an impressing and upsetting scenario. It's a unique game, an incredibly ambitious game, with so many talented people behind it, and there's still so much to know with an entire book and a one-hour documentary yet to be fully translated. But Clock Tower 3, whatever your opinion on the game, is certainly an incredible work of art worthy of the director who created it. It was also the last work of art he would ever finish. 
September 25th, 2002, a few months before Clock Tower 3 was released to the world, Fukasaku Kinji held a press conference in which he announced he had been diagnosed with prostate cancer. He also announced he was going to continue working and would begin filming his next project, a sequel to Battle Royale, later that year. On December 16th, filming for Battle Royale 2 began. Fukasaku would only be on set for five days. On December 21st, he was admitted to the hospital, his condition worsening. He underwent chemotherapy and developed pneumonia due to his weakened immune system and exhausted body. Yet he still hoped to recover and eventually return to work. It was not to be. He would pass away on January 12th, 2003, in the company of his wife and family. Battle Royale 2 would go on. It would be directed by Fukasaku's son, and the man himself would receive posthumous credit as director. For many, the film is considered Fukasaku's last project. Yet Clock Tower 3 is, in fact, the final creation he worked on from beginning to end. It was an attempt to blend two worlds, yet even now it seems film and games stand so far apart that few consider Clock Tower as part of Fukasaku's career. It's clear from his enthusiasm and dedication that he put his heart and soul into the project. He was demanding of himself and others, wanting only the best, and even recorded for posterity how the game was made and the people who made it. These records capture lost glimpses of many who have since left us. Sugimura Noboru would continue working at Flagship and would write the scenario of the next Clock Tower game. It wouldn't be called Clock Tower, but would be rebranded as Haunting Ground. But it was certainly the spiritual successor and the sequel in all but name, taking the gameplay style, the thematic elements, the story themes, the campy acting and heavy theatrical dramatization blending all these things together into a more coherent and terrifying package. I like to think that Fukasaku would have approved. Haunting Ground would be Sugimura's last project. He died suddenly of heart failure in February of 2005. He was only 57 years old. Colleagues remember Sugimura as a kind person and a generous boss. Okamoto Yoshiki, producer at Flagship, was shocked to hear of his death. Sugimura had been such an energetic person, he couldn't imagine the man was already gone. The team which developed the Resident Evil 2 remake had only fond memories of Sugimura. At a roundtable discussion, they talked about how caring he was, that he was enthusiastic and fun, and so excited at the potential of games as they evolved. Kamiya Hideki, the man who created DMC from Sugimura script, also remembers him fondly, speaking of him as someone who had a deep love of the Resident Evil series. The leader of the background design team, Noguchi Ryu, would eventually retire, though he still drew concepts for various projects from time to time. In January of 2012, he passed away, only two days after his 68th birthday. While many of the older generation have since passed on, many others continue to work in the industry, using the skills they learned from those that have left. Two of these young people were assistants of Fukasaku Kinji, working as sub-directors on the movie concept. These were people who were basically on hand during motion capture and recording to assist Fukasaku. One of them was Kawamura Yasuhisa, a game designer who was young at the time and has many fond memories of the experience. One includes a story of a six-hour-long session of turning a steel frame for a singular scene. Another is how he ended up inheriting the sandals that director Fugasaku wore every day during filming. He apparently still has them. The other sub-director was also a young man new to the industry, who credits Clock Tower 3 as his first big break none other than Kodaka Kazutaka, the game designer who would go on to create the Danganronpa series. So much incredible creativity flourished on this team, both at the rise and fall of their careers. The final bow for some, 
the rising curtain for others. And while the game is very different, there is no arguing its value, its creative ambition, its artistic brilliance, and that it's still being played and talked about today is a testament to the incredible skill of all the people who worked on Clock Tower 3. ゲームという世界が私まだ未経験でしていくつになってもこの初再建というのは心躍るものでしてねこれはぜひやってみたいとお誘いを受けた時に思ったわけです。